Jesus, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you are big enough, that you love us enough, that you are faithful enough. We can handle, or you can handle all that we give to you. We can trust you. I pray that as we look in the scriptures, you would speak to us and help us today to know you more and to trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, I was just uh, I'm preparing a lecture that I'm giving on Tuesday on church history, and, and uh, one of the guys I'm talking about is a guy named Polycarp of Smyrna. Have you ever heard of Polycarp? You know what Polycarp is? It's a lot of fish. <laughs> Polycarp of Smyrna was the bishop of Smyrna. And at 86 years old, the Romans decided that he was a bad man and that they wanted to make him suffer. But they wanted to make an example of him. So they brought him up into the arena before the crowds and they said, deny Christ and you can go free. Just say that you curse Christ and then we'll let you walk off. If you don't see those lions over there, they're coming for you. And he said, six and 80 years has he been faithful to me. How could I then deny or curse my Christ? They said, well, we'll throw you to the lions. And he said, I'm not afraid. And they said, well, if you're not afraid of the lions, then we'll burn you. And he says, why should I fear the flames that can burn for an hour when before me would lie the flames of eternal hell? And Polycarp was burned before a whole crowd who cheered because he was the destroyer of the gods. He was an evil man who was tearing down their false and pagan practices. But he never wavered because he knew this God who'd been faithful to him that long. That's your second freebie. That just came to me as we were thinking. <laughs> Have you ever been part of an event? Something that really was exciting. Something that everyone came to and that was really happening. You know, there's a parade going on or the show and shine. And just everybody's there. And you get to be part of this movement or this thing that's going on. I had this happen to me in 2005 the centennial of Alberta, I went to Edmonton, and guess who was there? Her Majesty the Queen. And I still, I've got a picture, I don't know where it is because of boxes, but <laughs> I have a picture that I took of Her Majesty the Queen walking down the stairs, and she actually walked from me to the end of that table away from me. And she probably would have turned and said hi to me, because of course I'm clearly the most important person in the world. <laughs> But I, I planned things badly, and there was this little girl in a wheelchair across the way from me. And of course, the queen being the queen, turned and said hi to her instead of to me. Bad planning on my part. But I was part of this event. People had come from miles around just to be there. We waited in the hot sun for hours. We watched as the bomb-sniffing dogs went up and down. And we watched all these guys in big overcoats on this hot summer day walking around like this. And you thought, hmm, I wonder what's under that overcoat. We could have uh, been in big trouble if we'd have tried anything. But it was so neat to see. And then I heard her speak live, and I watched all this excitement. The funniest part, I think I've told some of you guys this, was the reporters who were walking in front of her, trying to take their pictures and get their stuff. And one got too far. And in front of all of this, when everyone's trying to respect and honor the queen, here's these reporters going, get back, get back. It was, it was nuts. Anyway, it was an event. People go to see all sorts of events like this. They gather for all sorts of movements. It may be celebrities or political leaders, or maybe there's an accident and all the rubberneckers are stopping, stopping to see what's going on. There'll be, uh, you know, a migration that happens sometimes with critters or with our wildebeest when they go down for Sunday school sometimes. <laughs> but rarely has an event happened like what we are going to be studying in our passage today. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 8, and we're going to be in uh, uh, verse 14 here. Jesus was this one-time event that hit the Holy Land. Jesus came into Galilee ministering, and people were coming from miles around because there was something going on that had never happened on earth before. And the news was starting to get out. You remember just before this, as he was coming down from the mountain, he cleansed a leper, just like that. In came the leper, the kind of person that spread disease, the kind of person who was unclean and everyone steered clear of. And instead of the touch of the leper infecting Jesus, Jesus infected the leper and he was clean. 
Then along comes the centurion. You remember this guy, a Gentile. And it still is my favorite story in all of the stories because this Gentile guy walks up to Jesus and says, my servant is sick. Can you heal him? And Jesus said, sure, I'll come right now. And he said, hey, you don't have to come. Just speak the word and he'll be healed. I know this for a fact. And Jesus said, as you've believed, so it will be done. Well, then Jesus entered into Peter's house, and he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. This was a lady who was maybe not sick unto death, but sick enough that she couldn't get up. She was laying there with a fever. There was nothing she could do. She didn't even have the energy in her to go to Jesus. No one asked. No one said anything. But Jesus saw her. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose up and began to serve them. Jesus went into Peter's house. Side note, the disciples were probably mostly married. Did you know that? These guys weren't, you know, 20-year-old kids, and in that culture, you got married. So it's okay to get married. Good news. But Peter for sure was married. Why? He had a mother-in-law. Now, some people dislike their mother-in-laws. My mother-in-law is awesome, so I guess I'm in the spoiled few. But sometimes there can be tension. Sometimes the mother-in-law is the one that you're saying, you know, oh, good, she's sick. <laughs> and yet, here's Jesus coming in and seeing this lady who was sick. And where everyone else may have just passed by and given her room to recover, where maybe other people would have said, oh, you're sick, oh, stay away. I mean, we look around now, what's the cool thing to do? Quarantine that person for 75 years. And if they live, shoot them. And instead of that, Jesus saw her and touched her. And the fever left her. This is a different level. People before had come to him. We saw cool things happen, right? The leper came and said, can you heal me? It's, if you will it, it can be done. Jesus willed and it was done. Then the centurion came to Jesus and said, there's a servant who's sick. Can you heal him? Don't even have to come. Just say the word. But now this lady didn't say anything. Peter, I don't know if he got along with his mother-in-law, didn't say anything. Jesus saw her and before anyone asked, he touched her. And he healed her. And she was restored. And this wasn't just a restoration where she started to feel better. This was, he touched her, and instantly she got up and started making dinner. That's really good. She went from laying on her back sick to, okay, well, I guess I'll get back to work. She was totally, completely restored and feeling well enough that she was able to go and serve. If you think about that, that's amazing. I believe firmly in the man cold. Does anyone else get those? When I get a cold, I think it's my right to be pampered a little bit, to be served, you know. I'm going to lay there and I'm going to make sure everybody knows how miserable I am. Okay, maybe I'm not that bad. But it is miserable when I get a cold. Forget about the flu or something else. I will be sick and I will not be feeling well. And it's going to take me a long time to get back to it. For me, it settles into my lungs and for the next 16 years I get to cough. Just to remind me of that time when I was sick. I hate getting sick. And yet here Jesus came along and he saw her. He was not too distracted, too uncaring. He wasn't too busy. He wasn't too important. As he was going about his day, as he was ministering, as he was going to seek and save the lost, he had time to see people. This is one of the most amazing things about the Lord that we serve is that he is the God who sees. He's the God who knows. He's the God who cares. He doesn't just look at a face and pass on like we would do. He doesn't get overloaded by too many relationships. He doesn't get so busy doing the main thing that he can be distracted or walk past someone without truly seeing them. And this isn't just a surface level. He doesn't see what people present to them, to, to him. He sees the heart. You know, the Bible actually says, God doesn't look like you and I look. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And he truly does see right where we're at, right what's going on, whether it be a physical sickness, Peter's mother-in-law laying there, 
or whether he sees a sickness that's deeper down and better camouflaged. For many of us, we have a past. And we look at that past and we can hide that past correct, uh, pretty well. You know, we can put some makeup on it. Or we can throw some sort of a covering over it. For many people, we actually try to distract by the outside, right? We'll put on a brave face and be happy all the time. Or maybe we'll be tough so that nobody wants to get close. We'll do all sorts of things to shield ourselves so that people don't see us. Because for the majority of us, we're afraid that if people were to see us, what would they find? I'm just a little kid. I still, I'm 35 years old. I still feel like one of the kids in the room, right? You walk out and you're like, well, I'm supposed to be one of the big kids today. And I was saying to my friend the other day, you, you realize we're now the mature and responsible pillars of the community, right? <laughs> this is kind of crazy because I still feel like a kid. And for most of us, we feel like kids. We feel afraid. We feel doubtful. We know just how broken we are. We know just how sinful we are. We know all the problems, all the failures, all the things that nobody else may know because we keep them tucked up and hidden very well. Jesus knows and Jesus sees. And Jesus is never shocked, never appalled, never horrified, and never out of ability to fix, to solve, to heal, to restore. And he cares enough that when we don't even ask, he still does the work. That's one of the most amazing things about walking with God is as you walk with him, just on his own initiative, he rips things out of your life that have been festering there for years. He changes you in ways that you don't even imagine. And it's not like you sat down with him and had a list out and said, okay, Jesus, today we're going to work on my hair because that's really a problem. Next day we're going to be dealing with the way that I treat my wife. No, he just grabs hold of your heart. And before you know it, you're changed into this new creation. You're changed into who he meant you to be. He's done something that you never even dreamed. It goes beyond just healing and hope too. It goes to who you were meant to be and the life that you were meant to live. It says you're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that the Father laid out before you. You don't make that plan. You don't know how he's going to use you. You go about doing things in your day and God just takes you and does things and you're left going, who did that? Because he sees and he knows and before you even ask, he's there, never distracted, Never uncaring. How many of you guys have ever read Jonathan Swift, Gulliver's Travels? I highly recommend it, especially if you're of a political turn of mind. It's a guy who was writing in the 18th century all about the politics of his day, camouflaged in a fun story that people thought was for kids. But part of it is these guys that are so intellectual, so smart, so focused on the big things of the world that they're floating around on this island and they keep getting distracted. So they actually have servants with air-filled bladders behind them on a pole. And as they're talking to each other, the servants regularly bat them upside the head to snap them back out of whatever they were thinking about and keep them focused on their conversation. God's not like that. God is the smartest. God is the best. God has the most things on his mind. But there's never a time when he has to be whacked to get, pay, to get his attention back. You never have to send up a prayer so that he can get focused on you again because maybe he was lost in something else. You don't have to do like the priests of Baal and start cutting yourself and dancing around the altar hoping that perhaps he'll listen if you just shed enough blood. Jesus knows and Jesus cares and Jesus sees more than we even see of ourselves. You can actually go to him and say, hey, tell me about myself. And he'll tell you something you never knew. You know, like I've told you guys many times, for me, I knew that I wasn't academic and I'd never be a front of the church kind of person. Well, it turns out he knew more than me. And for each one of us, this is the way it is because he truly sees us. And he takes us on a journey that will lead us to some pretty amazing things. The scriptures also say the eyes of the Lord rove to and fro throughout the earth, seeking to show himself strong through those who love him. God loves to do things gratuitously awesome. He loves to go over the top. He loves to do things even before we ask and far more than we could ever ask or imagine. You don't think Peter's mother-in-law was probably laying there going, you know, I would like to be healed. But, well, I mean, 
sometimes you just have to get through a sickness. And along comes Jesus, peeks in the door and says, you're done, you're healed, you're back up and running. Isn't that awesome? So then he goes on. And people brought more to him. He touched her hand, the fever rose, and then that evening, everybody heard he was in town. So it was like the queen showing up, except this person has the power to heal. So they brought to him many who were what? Well, first, oppressed by demons. And he was able to cast out the spirits with a word. Just think about that one for a minute. How many of you guys have ever watched one of those shows where someone's doing exorcisms? I'm not a big horror movie guy, but I've heard about this one called The Exorcist. Have you heard about that? And apparently it involves someone puking and someone climbing on the ceiling and all sorts of things, and they're trying to exorcise the demon. Jesus didn't need to do that. He didn't have to have holy water and a stake to stab through their heart or anything. What did he do? He spoke a word, and the demons went to heal. Why? Because demonic forces have no power in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil is like a peacock. Have you ever seen a peacock wandering around an annoying loud bird? My grandpa used to have one that would sit up on top of the TV tower and wah, wah, all day long. But a peacock is actually a pretty small bird. But they've got this great big tail that they fan out to make themselves look bigger and to attract all the ladies. That doesn't work for me. I tried that once, but still got a wife in the end. It was all good. But they make themselves look big. They make themselves look threatening so that a carnivore and someone that would attack them would run away. And this is what the devil does. He's a great liar and he's a great showman. He's like one of those magicians you can go down and see and they pretend to do all these amazing things. But it's all smoke and mirrors and it's all illusion. The devil has no power but what is given to him for a particular purpose. And you know what's the biggest way that the devil gets power? When we open up our life and we say, come on in, the water's fine. And boy, does he come in. <laughs> and then we cast him out and we don't replace him with anything. And what does it say? Seven more show up to join the party. When the devil is given room, he can do amazing things. Demons will get a hold and they will oppress and even possess people. And I have seen it. Let me tell you, it's a real thing. The demons are out there and they are at work. And the demons think they're powerful. They try to make people think that you have to somehow uh, make them happy. You have to give them sacrifices or you have to do the right thing in order to make their power go away. You have to fear the devil because he might get you. And yet the truth of the matter is, at a word, Jesus walks in and says, get out. And they have to go. There's no negotiations. There's no checking to see if this is the devil's territory. There's no checking to see if this person or that person had life things that caused them to somehow be under the control. No! Jesus just said, go! And the devils went. The scriptures tell us that even the demons believe in Jesus and they tremble. Why? Because they know the truth. They deny the truth and they fight hard about the truth, but they cannot change the truth. God has all authority. Jesus is the ruler of the universe. And so he cast out the demons with a word. And on top of that, he healed all who were sick. They came and they were suffering in so many ways and he healed every single one. They asked and they received. He gave them healing. This is an amazing thing to see that Jesus didn't send them away feeling bad. He didn't send them away saying, well, try harder. He didn't look at them and say, you know what, you've got to hold your tongue right, or you've got to pray just so, or you've got to have enough faith, or you've got to try hard enough, or, you know, this one maybe will have to wait a little while. He healed them. And guess what? He does that today. Now, there is the fact that sometimes God gives us things for different reasons, you know, I, I tell people about my knees all the time. I've prayed for them to be healed many times. So far, they haven't. But I think that's because I'm a stubborn, stupid person. And if I didn't have bad knees, I might start thinking that I'm okay on my own and getting too prideful and getting too capable in myself. We have the story of the Apostle Paul with his thorn in the flesh. We don't even know what it is. Probably a mother-in-law. No. <laughs> and he prayed three times that this thorn would be removed. And guess what? 
It didn't get removed. But what did God say? My grace is sufficient for you because power is perfected in weakness. Sometimes God indeed does have a plan that involves a little bit of suffering. But we're allowed to ask. And guess what? When people ask, Jesus heals. When Natasha's feeling sick, and understandably doesn't want to go and put up with the health care system right now, she can ask, and Jesus can heal. When all the rest of us are struggling or feeling low, we can boldly ask, and Jesus will heal. And why can he do that? Why was this important? Well, this was done to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses. He bore our diseases. This is part of what Jesus Christ came to do. He came to seek and save the lost. He came to be the Messiah that people were looking for. He came to right the wrong that sin had done since the very beginning of the story. He is the healer of our mind, of our body, of our soul. There is nothing in the past that has to control us. There is no sickness, no physical thing, no suffering that is so great that it gets to define who we are. There is nothing that can stand against his power. That's something amazing. He came and he took our illnesses upon himself. He bore our diseases for us. That great disease of sin that started at the beginning that has caused all sorts of problems ever since, he came to heal. And he's done it for each of us. Now sometimes we look at our lives and we say, yes, but I can point to the things where I've prayed or I've asked and it doesn't seem like it's gone away. What about that? What about it? It can sometimes seem complicated. We ask and it doesn't seem like we get the response that we want. But we are left trusting him, looking to him, seeking him, searching for him. And what does it say? If you seek, you will find. He's not the kind that's just going to leave you dangling to teach you a valuable lesson. He's not the kind that's going to let you suffer because, well, it's good for him. He wants you to be free. And if the Son has set you free, you're free indeed. It's a promise. Now, I give you everything, as the song said. Some of the time, we would like our cake and eat it too. Have you ever had that situation? We come to the one who's borne our griefs and our sorrows, and we say, okay, here's the deal. I want you to bear all the griefs and the sorrows, and I'm going to keep all the sins. I want you to bear all the griefs and the sorrows, but I'm going to go on doing those things that have caused me to suffer. I want to be free from the pain and the suffering that comes from thinking ill of myself or from going down the wrong path or from living a life that I know is not of you, but then I want you to clean up the mess after I'm done. Sometimes we say, I don't understand why he isn't doing things. Well, <laughs> he gave you the way of escape for every temptation, but instead you took the on-ramp right into the middle of it. And people, people say that all the time, you know, why, why did this happen? Why did this happen? Where was God when? Well, he was right there saying, hey, if you do that, it's going to hurt. Jesus isn't there to get us out of our trouble after we've gotten into it on purpose. He's there to care for us and help us and heal us and free us from that sin. It often happens for people that they want both sides. And we have to be careful that we're fully surrendering to him if we expect to see healing in our lives in every way, shape, or form. He doesn't tow our line. We have to tow his. It was foretold. Jesus was not a surprise. It was a fulfillment of the word of God that he should come and that he should be the Messiah, that he should change us, heal us, make us into who we're supposed to be, do something that can't be done by us to make a new creation and let the old one pass away. It fulfilled the prophecy. But what was the difference between the real and the fake? How did you know? There was other people that had come and claimed to be messiahs. There was actually a lot of them. One would end up with the destruction of Jerusalem. There was a guy named, what was his name? Bar Judah, I think, who in AD 70 set up such a rebellion claiming to be the messiah that the Romans had had it. 
And they actually wiped out Jerusalem, leveled it completely, till there wasn't one stone on the other, just as Jesus had said. So many people had come to be the Messiah, but what was the proof for Jesus? I mean, you can look the same as someone, and it doesn't always mean they're real. I was thinking about this and thinking of Shane, a bull rider, right? Now, I could put on a stylish belt buckle, because that's a stylish belt buckle. I could wear some jeans. I could get a good hat. I've got a good hat. And I could swagger around and talk to you guys all about how great of a bull rider I am. There's only one problem. If you ever wanted me to prove that, I'd go running and screaming like a little girl the other way. Because I'm not getting on a bull. I'm not that brave. Shane, on the other hand, is. You know by the actions, by what they do, that the proof is there. One of the proofs of the Messiah, one of the ways that the prophet had spoken and said, this is the one that you have to look for, is that he would bear our illnesses and our diseases, that he would care for us in that way. He would show himself to us. And that is true today. Is he your God? Is he real? Ask him to heal and he will show himself for who he is. But sometimes we get cautious and hedge our bets on this one. Have you ever done this? Oh, yes, uh, Jesus is capable of healing, technically. Yes, uh, there was this time in the Bible where he did heal. But, you know, that's not for today. Because, you see, things are different now. You know, we have doctors. and we, So you don't need it. That's BS. That's hedging our bets. Maybe we're worried that it won't happen. You know, if I pray boldly and I ask God for something to happen and it doesn't, was my faith weak? Did I do it wrong? What's going on? So then I don't want to do it. Well, I wouldn't want to make God look bad, you know. I mean, if I pray for someone and they don't get healed, God would look weak, so let's not do that. Let's, let's cover for God and let's make sure that we're careful so that no one gets the wrong idea. Well, guess what? That's lack of faith. We don't believe ourselves that he'll do what he says he'll do. Or maybe we're afraid that we're going to do it wrong. Well, if I go and I pray and I didn't make the right incantation and I didn't do it the right way and maybe I don't have the authority, and what if I'm not the right person? Maybe there's someone else who could do it. All of a sudden we grow weak because we never ask. Well, it's, someone else is better for that job. Or maybe we do honestly doubt our God. Maybe we don't believe this gospel message that we preach and that we say we live. Maybe we look at God and we've seen something happen in our life that's caused us to shy away. And we say, you know what? I mean, God's powerful, technically. But in this particular instance, I don't know if I can trust him. So maybe I won't. I won't even try. Or maybe we're just not truly trusting or believing in Christ. Maybe our faith in him is more about doing than it is about being his. And so things like actually believing that he'll hear, actually believing that he answers prayer, actually believing that he'll walk with us is a bridge too far because it's actually just been something that we do, not something we are. It's never about not enough faith. It's never about getting the right words. There's no incantation that works better. It's just about asking the one who has the power and trusting him that he will do it. Because why won't he? Now, there's these word of faith guys, and I'm always cautious to stay away from that, right? They you know, claim the truth. And they no, no, no. Go to your father and trust him and ask. And let your father be the one who decides if something is good for you and bad. But ask repeatedly until he gets sick. Knock on the door until he's so tired that he says, okay, fine. <laughs> ask boldly because he sees you and knows you and you can trust him. The power isn't in the name of Jesus, by the way, as though it's some sort of a mystical syllable. You know, if you, Jesus, if you say it just right, then something's going to fall from the sky. The power comes because in the name of Jesus and by the authority of Jesus, all the universe has to act according to his will, not mine. I come as an ambassador with his authority because he has said, in my name, you have the ability to cast out demons. You have the ability to heal the sick. You have the ability to raise the dead. Trust and do it in his spirit, by his strength, and through his leading, by his authority. And it will happen. That's kind of cool, isn't it? That's kind of amazing. 
All right, Jesus sees and he will free. He takes our ills and evil will flee. Some say that faith in Christ is something that's cooked up to control people. Some say that it's all about just an opiate for the masses, something to calm people down and keep people under control, something to distract the weak or to make a crutch that you can lean on in difficult times, something that will trick you into feeling better. But Jesus is true. There are many who have experienced a faith that is empty and hollow of the saving and the sanctifying power of Christ because it's been all about what I do and because I don't really believe that he can. They've lived with hopelessness, with sadness, but this Jesus Christ is the master of the universe. He is the Lord and he has proven that he is who he is and he will do all that he wills to do. He will save you. He will sanctify you. He will free you from sin. He will heal you from sickness. He will help you to walk the way you were meant to walk. And he won't do it because you're so good, but because he's so great. He took our illnesses. He bore our disease. No matter what it is, mental, physical, spiritual, he is the great physician for us. There is no problem too big. There is no pain too great. There is no hurt from your past that is so large that it has to control and define who you are. That's one of the best things about being a new creation is it says the old is past and the new has come. Nothing can stand in the way of you walking with him the way you were meant to walk. We have the privilege as sons and daughters of God to bring many and to see them all healed. Yes, there are times when this, our Lord may choose to do something through sickness or suffering or pain. That's his prerogative and he can. But we have the right, we have the privilege to ask and we have the hope and the assurance that he sees, that he has the power and that he will indeed Heal us. Okay, CCF. Do you believe in this God who heals? When you're sitting there looking at your life, feeling the struggles, the pain, the sickness, the sorrow that's going on in your life, when you're seeing all of the things that no one else sees about you, when you're looking behind the curtain in the dark spots, do you believe that this Jesus Christ sees? Do you believe that this Jesus Christ knows and that he will reach out his hand and he will touch you and he will heal you? He won't look at you and say you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not fast enough. You didn't do the right things. If you want him, he's there. Just ask. Trust in him. Do you believe in this Savior who sees you, who knows your pain, who feels your failures, who sees into the deepest part of you, still loves you and cares for you? Do you want freedom from physical, mental, and spiritual pain today? You can ask. We're going to be opening the altar here in just a minute for you to come. If you need, ask. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find, the scriptures say. He took our illnesses. He bore our diseases. He saved our souls. He will do as he pleases. So let's pray. And I'll call, as after I've done praying here, we'll call the music team back up. And then if there's anyone who has needs, you come on up and we'll pray for you. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for who you are, and I thank you that you are mighty to save, to heal, to care. I thank you that you see inside of us, deep within. I ask that you would help us now. Give us the boldness, the bravery, 
to lay ourselves before you, to let those secret spots be revealed. I pray that you would heal us, strengthen us, help us to walk with you the way we were intended to walk. We thank you that we are indeed new creations and that because of you the old has passed away and the new has come. We pray now that you would heal us, help us, restore us. We thank you that you have taken our illnesses and borne our griefs. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.